Okay, good afternoon everyone. Thank you for coming and joining us in our second guest speaker series. I'm excited to see all of you. And um, we have our guest speaker here, Dr. Julius Johnson, who will speak to us today. That's amazing information for us. So I'm going to hand it over to Professor Daphne basically to introduce his bio to everyone. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so Mr. Dr. Julius uh, Johnson has been a registered nurse for over 16 years. He's a home-based primary care high intensity transitional care expert. He received his doctor of nursing practice from the University of Miami and his bachelor of science and master of science in nursing from Binghamton University. He's currently the department chair um, and FNP program director and associate professor of the nursing program at Long Island University, Brooklyn campus. Uh, he's practicing in house calls. He's the co-founder of DrNurses.com and also owns another company. He also serves as the chapter president of the Greater New York City Black Nurses Association, um, in which we are both members of. Uh, he was recently inducted as a fellow in the American Association of Nurse Practitioners um, and is the eighth Black male to do so. So that's a huge accolade. Uh, this is the highest award designated upon nurse practitioners. Some of his contributions to the community include, but are not limited to, building home-based primary care programs, transitional care programs to reduce rehospitalizations, and creating academic programs in higher education and leading COVID-19 vaccine clinics. So without further ado, I introduce to you Dr. Julius Johnson. Good afternoon, everybody. All right, let's try that again. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. One more time, because I believe in giving out the same energy you want to receive back. And let's let's get off to a good start. So good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Right, good, good, good. Uh, I would say my name, but she just read that long, tedious bio. And I kind of feel like having your bio read is like having the happy birthday song sung over and over and over again, right? Uh, so how's everybody doing today? <laughs> Good. Uh, it is an honor to be here with you all and be in front of you all. I'm going to speak with you all about nursing, uh, sharing my journey. I know the majority of time was supposed to be spent on the PowerPoint. However, um, I found it more beneficial when you spend the majority of time going through questions and answers. So I'm going to go through the PowerPoint. Uh, feel free to ask me questions at any point along that way. And then I'll make sure that we have adequate time for questions at the end. Does that make sense to everybody? Sounds good. All right. So uh, my background, which uh, Daphne has so eloquently put already, I'm an associate professor now at Long Island University, Brooklyn, where I also serve as the department chair. I am no longer the director of FNP program because I uh, gave away that position to somebody else that I trained. Thankfully, trying to get some. spent on doing home-based primary care in underserved, underprivileged areas. All right. So where I'm from, uh, how many people here are from New York City? Raise your hand. How many people here from Brooklyn? You have to make sure those six people get extra points on the next step. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'm from a place called Brownsville, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, Brownsville has the highest concentration of projects in the entire country. Um, I'm from actual Brownsville projects, and then there's other projects uh, with different names around them, like Tilden, Van Dyke, et cetera. Uh, but that's where I grew up. Uh, then I moved to Crown Heights, Brooklyn, New York, where anybody here is familiar with the Labor Day Parade? Yeah. Right. I was five blocks down from the parade on Montgomery Street. Um, I played organized sports, baseball, football, basketball. In other words, my mother was trying to find something for me to do to keep me out of the streets. Right, but I also grew up in gangs as well, as a product of my environment. So I joined the Brooklyn Skyhawk football organization, which gave birth to me dreaming. And what I mean by dreaming is that it gave birth to me wanting to get out of my neighborhood. Right, like I idealized football players. I wanted to be like them, run, catch, and I was also blessed by the good Lord to have some talent as well. So I was also offered scholarships to go play for the top prep school top Catholic schools, 
and I had a bunch of my coaches mad and upset with me because I eventually turned those programs down. And the reason I turned it down is because when I was in junior high school, I went to my dad's job. So my dad's a nurse. He's a critical care nurse. And I had no intention on being a nurse. Being a nurse. I was just with my dad for the weekend at his job. Anybody here hung out with their parents at their job waiting for them to get off when they was younger? Right? So I'm hanging at the nurse's station, and all of a sudden, I hear somebody running, and they go, dump her, dump her. And everybody in the nurse's station get up and take off. Now, where I'm from in Brownsville, if you're walking with a group of people and one person starts running, who knows the answer to this question? <laughs> so that's what I did from the nurse's station. I ran right along with the nurses. I didn't know where we was going, but I knew one. Let's go. One thing I knew that if it was danger that was still at the station, I was going to find it. And if it was danger where we was going, we was all going to face it together. So I got there, and they start. it was a patient. Dumper was a code word for when a patient codes. You know, when their heart stopped beating. So, like, I'm watching my dad and the other nurses beating on their, this patient's chest. They're doing CPR. They're intubating. They're doing all this stuff. And I just had this adrenaline rush. And I just kept saying, I need to do this. And I remember when we left, I went to my dad and I said, you need to tell me your exact steps so I can do exactly what it is that you do. Because it was the best adrenaline rush that I had ever had. So I knew I wanted to do nursing. I was fortunate enough to get into a high school that specialized for health professions. And they had a nursing assistant program. And I thought the world of that program, so I wasn't going to transfer out if another school didn't have that same program. So I stayed. Luckily for me, that was actually my bridge for me getting into Binghamton University, right? Because when I applied to Binghamton, I didn't have the, the GPA that they required, which was over 90. Like they wanted somebody with 94, 95. I didn't have uh, 1,300 on my SAT scores, but I had been in the CNA program. I had done a lot of work in nursing homes, hospitals, and I had also been a team leader by playing organized sports and being the captain and understanding the importance of teamwork. So I was able to leverage that in my letter for admissions to actually get into the program. I got to Binghamton, and I thought this was going to be the best thing in the world. And then when I got to campus, I realized for the first time in my life, I was an actual minority. And what I mean by that is that growing up where I grew up in my parts of Brooklyn, everybody looked like me, right? For the most part, the only times we saw somebody different is when we went to 42nd Street on Easter, right? <laughs> but right after that, we went back to Brooklyn and everybody looked like us. High school, football games, everything. So I got to Binghamton and discovered the true essence of what the word minority meant. At Binghamton, the population of black students is 3.5%. When I entered Binghamton in fall 2001, it was 3.5%. Currently, right now, in fall 2022, as I'm about to go to Binghamton next week for homecoming, the percentage of black people in Binghamton is still 3.5%. Right? So I got into my Psych 111 class, and Psych 111 had like 250 students. It was the largest thing I had ever seen in my life. I walk into this lecture hall, I sit down, and I'm like, there's nobody in here that looks like me. And then you just sit down and then had to deal with it. And I struggled mightily with that transition of how to identify now studying for college, not necessarily feeling uncomfortable by being able to reach over and ask somebody a question. And I struggled for a while. Uh, fortunately for me, I end up finding what I call my community by community organizations. I joined this great organization called Jump Nation, which is the Juvenile Urban Multicultural Program. And we bring up at-risk eighth graders from New York City to Binghamton University for an all expense paid for four-day weekend. Then we stay in touch with those students up until they become freshmen in college, right? So I spent 90% of my time at Binghamton not doing nothing nursing related. The only time the nursing building saw me is when we actually had nursing classes. It was to the point where my professors thought I actually didn't care about school at all because all the other students lived in a nursing building. But I had to work. I had organizations I was a part of. And I was also one of the many campus leaders, right? Meaning I'm an undergrad, so it's only but so much I can lead. Um, fortunately for me, the week before graduation, ABC did a special on Jump Nation, the ABC in Binghamton, not the big ABC. 
And I came to school the next day and the professor was like, oh my goodness, we never knew that you did so much. No wonder you're always so tired in class. We thought you was just partying and doing drugs and then rolling in the class. I was like, what? Y'all yeah. wasn't going to share that perception with me, but they did it, right? But fortunately, everything balanced out. Uh, so life after Binghamton, so graduated from Binghamton, everybody was talking about getting that good old job at uh, Academic Center in New York City, right? Like that was the goal for everybody. And I chased that dream. First, I was at Lenox Hill doing a graduate um, student nurse internship while I studied for my boards, passed them, went to NYU, and I was like, this is amazing. I'm finally in the ICU like my dad. And then I hated every bit of it. Hated it, hated it, hated it. Now, I'm not saying that's everybody experience because there's some people that live and die in critical care, right? And that was amazing. For me, it wasn't what I signed up for. I signed up for something more along the lines of flight nursing. Anybody here ever heard of flight nursing? Right? So flight nursing is really for when you're in towns with not a lot of hospitals and somebody gets hurt, they send a helicopter to pick the person up and then bring them back. We live in New York City, right? There's no, it's barely helicopters allowed to fly in New York City, let alone an actual space for flight. So I was like, man, this is not going to work, right? And then it was also a lot of political stuff um, within NYU Hospital that I didn't like at all. So I ended up leaving. But I realized that it wasn't my calling, it wasn't my purpose, but I struggled with that decision of knowing that, right? Like I knew it, but the pressures that everybody else was putting on me made me stay longer than I wanted to. And then even when I first left, I was still hesitant on whether or not I can actually be successful. Does that make sense? But eventually I did leave. Um, and then I went back to Binghamton for grad school, right? And I know for a lot of people, it was the craziest of ideas. They're like, you had this experience within that school. You're going to go back to the grad school where it's even less of you. But I did. And it turned out to be one of the best decisions that I ever made. Um, I had a mentor who got me in on a tuition scholarship for my for schooling. The program was good. However, the actual, meaning the content that I learned and my clinical experiences were great. They were top tier, second to none. My experiences with my professors was hell. Like I had a professor actually tell me I was her arch nemesis, right? Like imagine that, like you're having a conversation with your professor and she goes, you know what? I'm not going to have you in my group. I'm going to send you to another professor because you're my arch nemesis, right? And what I was actually doing is, fortunately for y'all, y'all don't get it as much now. It's still somewhat in the curriculum. But every time we talked about anything, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, strokes, cancer, it was always, these are your risk factors for developing these diseases. And they always had the term blacks on it for everything. And I will always ask, is it Blacks or is it where we live, right? Because back then, we didn't talk about social determinants of health. But I assume y'all use that word all the time now, right? Anybody here, anybody here doesn't know what social determinants of health? I tell you, teachers close their eyes. We can be honest. <laughs> Everybody knows? All right, cool. So I used to be like, it has to be something, right? Like, we're all growing up with these same conditions, and we're not genetically related. It has to be something else. And it was like, nah, it's because you're Black. Right? And these were the kind of conversations we would be having in grad school. Um, so that part of the program was hell. Everything outside of it, though, was great. Because I became, as a grad student, I became one of the top campus leaders because I was still involved in all of those organizations I was a part of as an undergrad. Right? So as more Black faculty left, I ended up filling that void, which ended up growing my network. But also, it tossed me into the fire. Just distract people from doing what they've got to do. Because for some reason, you say, well, they're not fighting for Jamaican and from crossing the border. Because if 10 Jamaican cross the border, I'll be a little clear. Oh, I don't even have uh, Okay. So they stopped it. It's fine. That's all right. We all accidentally unmute sometimes. <laughs> right? Uh, so those years were good. I graduated with my uh, family nurse practitioner degree. And then came home after grad school. And anybody, anybody here remember when Obama was elected? Yeah. Right. Great experience, great time. And then the first year after his election, the market plummeted. So here I am, fresh out of grad school, and saying, I need to find a job. And couldn't find a job. 
on top of still dealing with outlash from professors and I not getting along and them not giving me my degree. Right. right. So I finally sit for my boards in December. I pass it on my first try. Thank God. Then I start trying to get a job as a nurse practitioner. Couldn't find anything. But luckily, I had went to visit a nursing, and it was this company that was trying to bring back house calls. So I joined the company. When I first started, it was four of us as providers. It was a physician assistant, a medical doctor, myself, and one other nurse practitioner. A month into the program, the MD quit. The nurse practitioner told them she wasn't going to do this for too much longer, and she quit like two, three months down. And then it was myself and the other physician assistant. Um, luckily, within six years, we ended up building the program into the largest on the East Coast. Uh, we were, I had a very forward thinking medical director in terms of if there was anything that came out, he was going to throw us in, right? So who here know that, who here thinks that hospital re, um, rehospitalizations is a problem for hospitals? I, some people are shy. It's okay. Right? <laughs> So it's actually so much of a problem that one of the things that Obamacare ended up doing was penalizing hospitals for when patients are readmitted within 30 days for certain diseases, right? And what happened is that some hospitals, again, penalized so much money, it was turning into hundreds of thousands of dollars every year. So we created something called transitional care, which is how do you prevent rehospitalization? And I had a forward thinker medical director who was, oh, they're going to pay us to do that? Let's try to create a whole project that'll go along with it. So I had to, I had to, um, I was blessed and fortunate enough to be put in those situations to help lead and create and craft those programs that we then implemented with a bunch of hospitals, a bunch of institutions, and taught other providers how to do it. Uh, then eventually I decided I wanted to go back and get my doctorate, right? I wanted to practice, we call it practicing to the highest level of your degree, right? So we call it terminal degrees. But who here is loves who here loves doing research? Raise your hand. <laughs> professors, close your eyes. Who here doesn't like doing research too much? I'm gonna raise both hands. <laughs> My second hand is gonna be some for some of y'all that are shy. Right? So I knew I wasn't gonna get a PhD, but they had this thing called DMPs. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna do it. So I went and I applied for the University of Miami. Because I was like, I did my bachelor's and my master's according to everybody else. Go to a state school that's highly respected. You won't get that many loans, even though I still got a bunch of loans. And do it that way. So when it came to my doctorate, I was like, this is the last degree I'm getting. So I'm going to do it my way. So I went to the University of Miami, right? And when I got to my interview, like she's looking through my resume and my CV, and she's like, some of these things are great. What brought you to the University of Miami? And I said, you know what? I can tell you it's because y'all lead the state in research dollars. I can tell you because y'all are forward thinking and people always talking about it. They have an entire simulation hospital at the University of Miami. I, like, I could tell you all of that. But the real reason was because of your football program. And when I tell you that the associate dean jaw dropped, as I said it, she's like, all these people trying to get in this program and you just came up to me and told me you trying to go here because of the football team, right? Uh, but what she hadn't realized, and I ended up explaining, was that football was my way out, right? Meaning it was my dream. Nursing became the way out. So I always associated it with football. And when I was younger, I always wanted to play for the University of Miami, right? Like they looked like us and the kids I came from, they talked like us, like people disregarded them the same way they did us. And I just highly identified with them. So when I got a chance to get my doctorate, it didn't matter if Miami was ranked number one nursing program or if they was ranked 350, right? I was going there. Because if they was ranked 350, I was going to say, at least I went to Binghamton my, for my first two, right? But then I got to the University of Miami, and they kind of was like, what is Binghamton? I was like, we're going to work on it. I'll let you know by the time I'm done, right? So it was a great program. I had a tremendous experience. I learned the term translational science. Anybody here ever heard the term translational science? See, everybody here who said they do not like research, y'all need to learn the term translational science. What it means is that you translate research into actual practice, right? So 
somebody with a PhD, they do the research, they are experts in doing research. As DMPs, we become experts in translating that into actual practice, and then we become experts in evaluating that to see if it actually works. Once we finish doing that, we'll pass that over to somebody with an EDD, and then they will put it in actual teaching terms to show you how you teach somebody, right? And then we'll find a new program, uh, a new problem, and the three of us would do it all over again, kind of in a circle of nursing, right? Yes, so I'll use an example of um, one of the ones I had. So I told y'all I was doing these transitional care programs with SMA. So in Miami, we had to do what's called your DMP practice improvement project. You have to do some type of implementation that's going to improve practice. So I had looked at translational care practices and I looked at a whole bunch of research. There was people that did research on, meaning there was people that researched if surveys reduce rehospitalizations, if uh, medications, if nurses, nurse practitioners versus MDs. So I looked at all of this research and then I created this program based on the best concepts of what parts of research said they worked better. I put it into one program called High Intensity Transitional Care. I went down to Interfaith Hospital, which is a safety net hospital. Anybody here ever heard the term safety net? Yeah. Right? So for those who haven't, safety net means that you get a large proportion of underserved, <coughs> um, uninsured population. And then I implemented the program and I evaluated patients over 30 days seeing if I can track them and seeing if they were rehospitalized. I end up preventing rehospitalizations in 83% of the patients that I did the program on, right? So now that I was finished, then it goes, how can you sustain it? Once that's finished, I now pass that data over into somebody with an educational doctorate, EDD, and then they talk about how you can take this and teach this in the best practice so that students can actually learn it, right? Because sometimes what ends up happening is that you have somebody with a PhD that will just come and talk to you about research, and in the back of your mind, you're going, what are they talking about, right? I thought this was med surge. Then you have somebody like me that will come in and just talk to you about practice, and you're like, I get that he did it, but he's not telling me how to do it. Does that make sense? And somebody with an EDD comes in, and they'll tell you, this is how you do it. This is a step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step approach into making this possible. Answer the question. All right. So life after Miami also taught me the importance of nursing organizations. Um, because as you have heard me talk about, I talked a whole lot about stuff that wasn't necessarily nursing organization related, right? There was I talked nothing about Sigma Theta Tau, American Nursing Association. I didn't even I honestly didn't even really know knew that the National Black Nursing Association existed. And what the University of Miami did was pour into us and say, like, I'll never forget um, one of my mentors and associate dean telling me, uh, we were picking DNP practice improvement projects. And some of the kids, right, especially like the black kids, we wanted to do some wild things. Some of it didn't make sense. Like, when your students get frustrated at you, it's not just your level. Professors get frustrated at doctorate students all the time, too. So don't feel bad, right? And I remember her saying, all of this is good, but you're going to do something that affects your community. And he's like, why would I do that? I don't want to do that. And her response was, if not you, then who? Right? Meaning, if not you as somebody who came from this community, saw the problems, understand the problems better than other people, who else do you think is going to change something? And it just always resonated with me because I had intentionally not did anything within nursing because I just didn't want to. Right? Like, I didn't have the best experiences in my bachelor's and master's with professors, so I did a whole bunch of work outside of nursing. Miami refocused me. For the first time I joined and was initiated into Sigma Theta Tau, I came home and joined the National Black Nursing Association, right? Um, who here has even heard of National Black Nursing Association? Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. They were on Facebook the other day as well. So, at the time I joined, there was only one chapter in New York City, right? Meaning it's a national organization that's been around for 51 years. It was one chapter in Harlem. We created a whole nother chapter to serve all of New York City, 
right? Um, it's great because under it, ooh, sorry, go back one. We end up starting an opioid overdose prevention program. That program ended up collaborating with um, some DJs to create a program called Last Night a DJ Saved My Life, uh, where we do Narcan trainings. We'll talk to people how to prevent overdoses. We'll talk to them how to treat it, mm-hmm. where they can get help. Uh, right in different bars, nightclubs, we go to schools, universities, communities. Well, sometimes we're in the corner. We end up doing that. We end up creating a black maternal health group because black moms are five times more likely to die from pregnancy first compared to their white counterparts. Uh, we end up adopting schools, mentoring students, sponsoring students. Uh, you name it, and it affected the community, we ended up doing it, right? And it ended up truly being a blessing. And then COVID hit. Everybody here remember COVID? <laughs> right? Some of y'all are sad that you got to actually be back in the classroom, right, post-COVID. Uh, but we know when it first hit, it was a scary time for New York City. You said mute the mic? I need to be oh, mic. Sorry. All right. So we ended up, um, the COVID vaccine came, and we had to figure out what were we going to do, right? So we did a bunch of different things. We advocated to get testing centers in New York City. Because for those of you who can remember, the testing sites in New York City when COVID first hit, y'all remember where they were at? Yeah, they were at um, the party. CBS party. The school. The stadium, right? They were all in Manhattan. Uh, oh, right. right. In order to get a COVID test, you had to go into Manhattan, and usually the east coast of Manhattan, the east side of Manhattan, where that cluster of hospitals were, right? And we were like, hey, we need testing sites in our neighborhood. So we advocated. We got we called some politicians that we knew, and we got them to put some in churches. We got them to eventually put them in parking lots. Really put them all throughout the neighborhood. Then the vaccine came, right? And how many people here were scared to take the COVID? Vaccine? That's the honest, right? Uh, we ended up pulling in before uh, their vaccine came out. We pulled Johnson & Johnson together, and we got people from their research team, and then we put them on a live Zoom with three community, right? Which was great because they started answering questions directly. We had a bunch of people who didn't really believe that it was real, and we were staging it. So when they would mute their mic, it's like, am I really talking? Can y'all really hear me? <laughs> uh, so that was beneficial because it gave the community a voice. We ended up running COVID vaccine clinics where we vaccinated over 30,000 people, <coughs> with um, more than 70% of them being uh, communities from neighborhoods that was affected disproportionately. <coughs> And uh, through my work with MBNA, with uh, COVID, uh, with SMED. Sorry, I'm hot. I'm not used to talking for this long. <laughs> so with, um, I was blessed and fortunate enough to be inducted as a fellow into the American Association of Nurse Practitioners. Uh, I became, so actually I'm the seventh black male to be inducted. That's really shenanigans, meaning it was two of us inducted at the same time. And I was trying to be, uh, you know, life lessons of uh, deferring to the older person. So I was trying to let him claim seven and I was going to claim eight. But then he caught up with me at MBNA Nationals. And then told me, your name comes before mine, so you're seven, and I'm going to claim eight. And I was like, seven is my favorite number, so let's go for it. <laughs> right? Uh, so I was inducted, which is great. Uh, it's a great honor, but then it also means more work. Right? But most important job is actually being a dad. Right? I have a four-year-old going on five who stresses my life. Uh, she's actually in kindergarten now, um, in school. And I found out on Monday that she has a little male friend that sit next to her. <laughs> Ooh, her mother said they walked home from school together. Class to make sure that I'm okay for today so I can get there and see who this little boy is. <laughs> right? And then, you know, it's always what's next, right? And it's actually my last slide. Uh, like what's next and what's next for opportunities. And for me, a lot of that is 
providing opportunities for other people. Um, we also, through MBNA, we had this opportunity to work with, anybody here has heard of NIH before? Right? Stands for National Institute of Health. They actually do the most research in the country. They sponsor the most research in the entire country. They're government organizations. So they have a program called All of Us, right? And do all of us, what they are doing is they are trying to enroll more underserved, underprivileged populations in research than ever before, right? So it's a longitudinal study, meaning that it's long term. But the thing that I loved about it is that one of the things I started finding out is a lot of research, right, is not really based on people that look like me. Right, meaning the research and the numbers that, so for example, who here knows the normal, normal level for blood pressure? Normal blood pressure? Yeah. 128. What is the number that you can go up to the most before it's considered high, high blood pressure? 130. 130 to 139. Anybody else? <laughs> and it's a trick question because it's two organizations that determine it. I tell you, don't feel bad. Nursing is not the only people that can't get everything together. So there's two organizations, the American Heart Association and then the, American, uh, then the Association of Clinical Cardiologists. Um, so they have one set of rules, and then what we call the Joint National Commission, they have another set of rules. So one of them is less than 130 over 80, and then one of them is less than 140 over 90. So if you heard both, both are actually correct, right? But what I found out, was that who do you think those numbers is based on? Meaning, who do you think they tested to say that these numbers are based on this? A couple of you said it, white males. Look at Helene Foles showing out. I'm talking about. <laughs> right. So a lot of it was based on white males. It wasn't based on women. It wasn't based on minorities. So I was like, I want to see what more research looks like for us, right? The same way that who here has heard, have you did pharmacology yet? Uh, Some of y'all, right? So when y'all start doing pharmacology, they're going to talk to you about a specific blood pressure medication called an ACE inhibitor, right? And one of the things they say for ACE inhibitors is they go, you can't give ACE inhibitors to black people, right? And I always respond by saying, wow, that's, you know, a little drastic and aggressive. Just meaning that, for example, anybody here identifies as Asian? That's inside Asian. We're... Where's your family from? Tibet. Tibet? Your family. <laughs> so, normally, if you, oh, we have, are you Asian? Let them fly Asian. Where's your family from? My family comes from China. China. Okay. Now, is Tibet and China the same thing? Right? You have different customs, different food practices, a whole bunch of sorts of differences which y'all all identify as Asian, right? What a lot of people don't understand is that black folks is just like that, <laughs> right? And I'm so serious. Like, I'm like, there's an entire continent called Africa that's made up of a bunch of different countries, that's made up of a bunch of different cities, and all of them have different cultures and practices. Not to mention when you come over to America, right, you have Af African Americans, that descend from slavery. You have Caribbean Americans from the West Indian Island, right? You have Africans that now live in America. So we're all different. So you can't just say all black people. <coughs> uh, but that is the end of my presentation, and I want to open it up for questions. But anything that y'all would like to ask me, nothing is actually off limits. Y'all can ask me anything. So, I would say one, always remember it's okay to dream. It's good to dream, right? Some of your dreams haven't even come to you yet. I promise you that. Two, uh, don't ever think that you only have one purpose. You don't. I know a lot of people think they have one purpose. And for a lot of people that revolve, revolve around their kids. Oh, my one purpose is to be a mom. That's not your one purpose. You have multiple purposes. 
Uh, and then also three, remember that nursing is a very big field, right? If you love bedside nursing, go for it, stay there. If you don't love bedside nursing, go into one of the other hundred other jobs that you can do as a nurse. You can do visiting nursing. You can work as a public health nurse. You can work in politics and advocacy. You can work as a nurse for a pharmaceutical company. There are hundreds of jobs you can do as a nurse. Do not get into the nursing field, right? Because nurses deal with a lot of bullying. Get into that field, get bullied by somebody, and then decide that you're going to let all of your hard work go and give it up. There's much more that you can do with nursing. And there's another question. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, when you first realized that you wanted to do nursing, like, what are some of the steps that helped you go from where you was to where you are now? Or at least, you know, going into the Binghamton. Um, so really, because sometimes you have to be around like-minded people for the journey that you're going to take, right? And one of the best things I did was on September 11th, and when I say September 11th, I mean when the towers fell. I was in Binghamton as a freshman ready to quit and go home. And I ended up running into people that looked like me that was also in the nursing program. And I hung on to those women for dear life for the next four years until I got out of school. But what it does, it helped me form a study group, right? It helped me be around people who were talking about doing things. Like, I've never heard of that. All right, cool, let's, let's go do it, right? Like some, you can have multiple groups in life some of your groups need to be around like-minded people that have like-minded goals, right? And once I got around that, I was like, oh, I'm just going to pour into this. I'm going to absorb into this. Does that make sense? Well, I would say it's actually a great question. If y'all didn't hear it, it was, what if you've been in nursing for a while and you kind of feel like you've lost your love for nursing, right? This was actually very common for a lot of my nurses that were going through COVID. Like I had people walk away from our uh, Greater New York City Black Nursing Association chapter because they were through with nursing that, with nursing in terms of what happened to them during COVID. Like literally, like people, Dr. J, I love you. I'll do anything you ask me to do. I'm not going to anything else nursing related and leave, right? And it was a real thing that we had to try to figure out. And we like, what do we do, right? Like let's sponsor some, some food for them. Cause you know, normally nurses come out to anything that got food in it. You throw alcohol in it, they normally there too. But that was also a struggle, right? And for some people I had to tell them, it's just gonna take time sometimes, right? And sometimes you have to give somebody an opportunity to realize why they love you again. And that's with nursing, right? Like nursing is like a person that you wit, you love, you fall out of love with, right? Sometimes you're in lust with. That's exactly what nursing is. And sometimes you just need a reminder. And then also sometimes, right? Like a good breakup, you need a change of scenery. And that's what it is with nursing too. Sometimes you need a change in what you were doing. And almost all of those nurses that was falling out of love they went back to school to get away from what made them fall out of love with nursing, right? And now they're back in it. So I got a couple of them back in the chapter. Like one of them, she just graduated from Lehman. Um, she's talking about doing like holistic uh, medicine, holistic healthcare. Uh, she's talking about doing medical marijuana. Like she's great. But then she's also going to do like some house calls. But she loves where she's at and being able to get away from it. But she's also now disassociated herself with being upset by certain things. So if she takes a travel contract to make a whole bunch of money, when she's in there, she's like, y'all can say whatever you want to me for the next 12 and a half hours because you're paying me. And at the end of that 12 and a half hours, don't talk to me. Right? And then she'll come back. But she loves everything else that she's doing. One question. Yes. Can you say what's your biggest struggle from Growing up in Brownsville slash Concrete, 
to now going to like literally like a 180 of the answers. Like what was the biggest struggle coming out from there to a whole different new setting? And when I went to Binghamton, <clears throat> I had to learn not to treat everything like it was, like I was back in the hood. Like that was my biggest struggle. So and for those of you who don't understand, it's just that, like where I'm from, you got to walk a certain way, you got to talk a certain way. And I'm also, one of the things I do with my students, I'm big on TV shows and I'm big on lyrics from songs, hip hop, R&B. So I always make references, right? So there's one Jay-Z song where he says, um, the way you deal with guys who step out of line is how your rep solidifies, right? Just meaning that the way you handle problems means if somebody's going to test you again or they're going to leave you be. And when I got to Binghamton, I had to leave that alone. Like, I had to have some friends out grab me up and was like, what are you doing? Right? Like, we're not back home. You can't act like that. Like, yo, what do you mean? Like, this is just what I know. So I had to learn something different. I had to form a new habit. That was my biggest thing. But once I formed that new habit, um, I also had to learn how to transform. And being able to transform is both a good and a bad thing, right? So some of your professors may not understand that. A lot of you will understand it, right? Meaning you transform and the person you are is determined by the situation you're in. So it doesn't mean that you are actually that person. You just you start talking different. You start dressing different. But in your head, you're going... I can't wait until this hour and I'm going to take all of this off, right? So I had to learn the ability to transform to operate in different circles. Okay, so um, this one matches like a question that I have more so um, a thank you. Um, being from Brooklyn, I was born in Bedside, and you always hear like the only way to make it out is athletics. Like anything, one, jump. Like everybody's going to tell you, just do it. Like it's fine. You never hear like it's okay to do something academic and get out too. So I just want to say thank you for that because that definitely gives everybody a different perspective and a different motivation. Like, I mean, I'm not saying I'm the youngest in the class. I am on the younger spectrum, but I am going to say that my high school it was another high school. I didn't go to Clara, but my high school is definitely academic, and it was either you sink or swim. So it was a lot of us that came in from whatever areas in the hood, and they were just like, okay, well, you're either going to learn or you're going to play sports. And I, like I said again, just big, thank you for that. Because honestly, if I wish other people were here, like our families and stuff like that, because we don't all have somebody in our life to sit there and be like, it's okay to read a book. Like, okay, sit down and read a book. Like, if everything is, oh, you have to run, and that's the only way to make it out. So, yeah. Definitely, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. So, I also coach football, right? I know some of y'all are like, when do you sleep? <laughs> uh, so, I also coach football for the same team I played for. And I remember the first time, I used to have a red bin, right? And it was one of those, I'm a nurse practitioner now, I'm getting a luxury car. And I had this candy apple red bin that I used to love. So the first time they saw me get out of it at the football field, my kids was like, yo, coach, you sell trucks? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, technically, no. Technically, yes, right? <laughs> um, they're like, you rap, right? They're like, how long you played in the NFL? Like, never, not a single day, right? And I was like, no, I'm, I, this is what I do. Like, I'm a nurse practitioner. And they was like, all right. And it's like, coach Lyon, right? Like, this, like, that's just what it was, right? Like, coach, coach Lyon, he knows too many people in the hood to not sell drugs. And then they saw me on TV one day uh, as a nurse practitioner with a company. And they were like, and I had completely forgot it was airing on a Saturday and we had a game on a Saturday. So I came to the field and the kids was like, coach, you a doctor? <laughs> it was just so mind blown. And what I started realizing was that kids in our neighborhood don't want to be drug dealers, rappers, or athletes. They want to be successful. But the only successful people that come back to the neighborhood are drug dealers, rappers, and athletes, right? Like, doctors don't come and kick it with kids in the hood. Doc and I had to start telling people, because I'll do talks for, um, like, people on probation. for different. And I had to start telling, like, they would have these motivational speakers come in. And I would go, stop telling those little kids that gangs are bad for them. And they're like, how can you say that? You, you have a whole doctorate. I'm like, 
Yeah, but I was also in the game, right? Without ever having to say I'm no longer affiliated with it, right? And I was like, what you don't understand is that those gangs are there for those kids all the time. When you stop in and tell them, yo, this is all bad, and then you leave, you're here for 30 minutes, right? When those kids are hungry, they feed them. When those kids go to school and somebody pick on them, they dare for them, right? Sometimes they protect them and keep them to the side, especially if they're the smart ones or the athletes. Yo, you got a future. Stay away from this. And you're not here. So what you're doing is you're disassociating them from the only thing that has consistently cared about them. Now, you can tell them you can go transform the game. You can stay out of certain things. And, like, every time I say that, kids' eyes pop up. Because I tell them, like, I know what it is. Y'all don't want to do that. You just want to be successful. Buy, buy your moms and parents a nice house, get a nice car, get away from this. You want to be successful. So my goal is just to introduce more ways of being successful to people. Some of it. Go ahead. So right now, being a nursing student, I'm dealing with, um, as motivated as I am to be a nurse, I am dealing with some discouragement when I hear rumors or other people's personal stories of being a, coming a nurse, especially being a new graduate, dealing with the bully culture in the hospitals and not having the proper guidance. Um, and even being in clinicals, you hear about other student nurses, preceptors, not really being helpful and teaching them properly or um do you know of or can offer or maybe you can create one like some type of mentorship program or like where or internship where nursing students can have someone to help guide them properly so that way they feel a little bit more prepared i know helene felt offers um different opportunities but anything outside that maybe can help us further our um, experience or increase our confidence as we move forward? So um, I'm going to teach you a saying, and then I'm going to give you something else. So the saying I'm going to teach you all is called, do what you have to do so you can do what you want to do. Yeah. Right? That's one of the most important lessons I learned while being a nurse. Do what you have to do so you can do what you want to do. So when you go through those times of bullying, people being dismissive, at some point, it's going to click in your head. Yo, you know what? I'm going to do what I have to do. Because as soon as I finish this, I'm going to go on and do what I want to do for a very long time. The other part of that is networking, right? Finding your network, finding your community, finding your people. Um, so different chapters do it. I'm sure like NYBNA does it. <clears throat> we do it at Greater New York City. You also have, and one of the other things I realized is that there's a nursing organization almost for everybody. Meaning, like, there's National Association of Hispanic Nurses, there's an Asian nursing organization, there's a Jewish nursing organization, there's an American Association of Men in Nursing, right? Like, you have MBNA, you have all these different things in nursing. And I realized that when I became part of those organizations, I started creating networks. Networks for myself, but also networks for other people. Whereas I can say, oh, you need a job? Yeah, we're hiring. Right? Like, one of the best things I love to do at the end of our chapter meetings is that we'll ask, Anybody here recently passed their NCLEX? Congratulate them. And then I'll go, who are the hiring managers? And they go, we are. We're hiring. Like, you need a job? I'll hire you. Right? Because it becomes a difference when somebody is trying to bully you on the floor, and you're like, you know what? I'll be right back. They'd be like, where you going? Don't worry about it. I'll be right back. <laughs> and you go to the hiring manager that's also your chapter member. Like, I got this problem. Maybe like, I'll handle it for you. Don't worry about it. And then you come back, and they're like, or we know not to play with you, right? Like, it's also a difference when my students that are part of the chapter, that are also at LIU Brooklyn, when they complain to me about something that a professor is doing, and then I go ask that professor, all right, are you doing it? Because if you're not doing it, I'm going to go get on my chapter member. But if you are doing it, we're going to change this behavior now, right? Because I'm big on changing behavior, changing the culture. We can't survive for another generation of nursing treating nurses how we've been treating them. Right? Like, we just can't. And people always say um, nurses eat their young. And then it's a saying that that starts in when you get to the bedside. It doesn't. It starts in college. Right? Because some of the ways that professors treat students are terrible. And some of the things I've been telling to my professors is understand that your students are going through things. Right? Like, we're knocking our head on the wall of being traditionalists for a system that has changed 15 times since that tradition was created. 
So we spent a lot of time doing that. I was also um, fortunate enough and blessed to be on the National Commission to Address Racism, racism in Nursing. Anybody here has heard of that report? Oh, yes, should all read it. It's great. It has a lot to do with that, right? Um, and it's this national report that we put out on the history of nursing, right? Anybody here heard of Florence Nightingale? Right? <laughs> I think she's great. One of the most racist people you ever meet, right? So we talked about all of this in the commission, right? And we also talked about how can we change education, right? These are our recommendations. How do you change practice? These are our recommendations. How do you change policy? These are our recommendations. How do you change research? These are our recommendations. And you're going to start hearing a whole lot more about it. We even got the American Nursing Association to come out and say, hey, we were racist and we led to a lot of division within nursing that we're now earning, owning. All right. I know I saw your hand up. I saw that uh, article and I was wondering why, what made them, I guess that was you guys that, uh, I guess, compelled them to make that uh, letter. Racial, racial reckoning statement? Yeah. Yep. Wondering, like, just curious on, on why, how that you know came out. Oh, yeah, because it was one of those where they got some of us together to talk about this. And when you get people that don't play in a room, one of the things you're not going to do is one of my favorite sayings, sayings Oh, I'm not sure who told you this, but you're not going to play with me, right? Like, we can go play football or something else, but you're not going to play with me. And so, when we got in this room to do this work. One of the things was, we're not going to play around with this. So we going to be honest, we're going to start with y'all. And they was like, oh. And then as we start doing more and more work, they start realizing, yo, we need to say something because we aren't necessarily who we thought we are. Or we can no longer sweep this under the rug. So they said it, right, which was great. Um, but it's also a start because now it's where do we go from here? And I know you had your hand raised, right? Brooklyn Skyhawks? Are you familiar with the Titans? The Titans? Titans? Yeah, I'm familiar with Brooklyn Titans. Yeah, East New York Renegades. They used to play in our division way back. The old East New York Renegades with the red. Here we go. You know what? <laughs> I know we said you five points earlier. We got to take those away. We got to take those away. Yes. You have your hand raised? Oh, you just got, okay, my bad. She's stretching. She's like, you need to wrap this up. Uh, any more questions? Um, I guess COVID had me thinking that one stream of income isn't important, is not enough, right? And so multiple streams of income is important. How would you then suggest, like, once you graduate, you're in the field, it's like one or two years, to then, you know, become a nurse entrepreneur? So let me also say this. Any, who here wants to be a millionaire in the future? Okay, here. Oh, a millionaire. Who here wants to be a millionaire in the future, right? So I'm also big on, because I spent so much time outside of nursing, reading a whole bunch of books that's not nursing related and then applying it to nursing. So that goes back to that translational science that we was talking about, right? Good book is called The Seven Highly Effective Habits of Millionaires. One of the things they talk about is that if you want to be a millionaire, you need at least seven streams of income, right? So you need to start figuring out how am I going to get multiple streams of income, right? And, and in this day and age, you can do it. Especially you start getting some nursing money. I know nurses who, when they go to work, people look like at them and they're like, you're completely blacked out. And I'm like, that's because they're not here for this job. they just here to get the money and they go, hey, I got this real estate company. I'm going to go put this in. We're going to go buy some more properties and then we're going to flip it. We're going to do some Airbnbs over here. We're going to go get a truck and have a truck driver drive this truck and we're going to make money off the truck. Right? We're going to open up this restaurant over here. And that's literally what they're doing. So the blessings of being a nurse is that they're going to pay you very well. Right? A lot of times to do stuff that you don't necessarily want to do. But you take that money and you invest it into all of that stuff you want to do. Right? Also, when you first get your, because nobody told me this coming out of school, invest in your 501c3 that your company is going to offer you. Right? Autom and invest in it. Right? Max out. And I'm sorry, 43B. Max out on it. And by that, what I mean is that you get a certain amount of money that you can put away tax-free that the government won't tax. And then it just grows in the market. And it's also protected. So make sure that you do that. 
Is it true that nurses um nurses don't have any rights? The patient is always right. No, that's not true. That's not true. Who advocates for nurses? We do. Nursing organization. That's it. Uh, oh, uh, not really yeah. just one, no, I <laughs> but I wanted to ask our um, audience that um, has uh, logged in here if they have any questions online. Is anyone um, who is who is tuned in um, online uh, have any questions for Dr. Julius? I've heard before that like people say the best NPs are nurses with a lot of bedside experience. How long did you work bedside before you went here? <laughs> you just fall right into it, or so it's actually something that's asked a lot, right? And it's not. And one of the reasons is that when you are a nurse, right, uh, you work bedside, you used to take an orders. Even when like when you start working nursing, if y'all start bedside. The worst time to ever be hospitalized is in the month of July. Anybody want to know why? Yeah. Residents. All the residents. Residents. They all, <laughs> they all start on July 1st, right? And you end up getting a lot of what I call the suggestive, hmm. Meaning you call them, hey, this patient is going da 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 da, and they're like, hmm. <laughs> and he goes, do you want to do X, Y, and Z? And like, yeah, let's, let's, let's go ahead and try that, right? So sometimes what happens is that it's a hard transition for bedside nurses to go from bedside into nurse practitioners because you have to grow into autonomy. And anytime you are growing in life, it's uncomfortable. That's why they call it growth, right? And there's a lot of people who struggle with that. Or you get some people, like when you become a family nurse practitioner, right? You're responsible for everything. Meaning you're supposed to know everything of somebody walking to a clinic. When you're bedside nursing, you only really know what you know for your unit, right? So you, like I have critical care nurses that come into MP school and they're trying to treat everybody like they're having an active heart attack. And you're like, that's not, that's not going to happen. Like just, we don't need to start CPR. Trust me. Trust me. It's fine. It's okay. Right? Um, so sometimes it's a transition. So it's, it's different. Some people is great. I also have students who go straight from RN school. They're done getting their bachelor's and they come right into the MP program. Right. And I tell them work. It's going to take you at least two years to get through the MP program. Work while you go through the program. Right. So it all depends. You don't have to. So I hope you don't have in your mind. I'm going to be a nurse practitioner. I got to do five years. So whenever you ready to go, go. All right. You're welcome. Anybody else? I knew that I was never going to do med surge. Like from the day I walked into med surge clinical, I was like, yeah, this is not it. Like I was walking around like, I'm not doing this. And the professor's like, you got to start a med surge. I was like, I bet you I won't. <laughs> right? So what happened was when I was graduating, um, they were like, yo, we'll give you this med surge job. And I was like, how do I get in critical care? And they're like, we don't take new grads. And I was like, but I had did a summer externship at Kings County. So Kings County was like, oh, we'll take you in intensive care. Um, I was at Lenox Hill. This decision actually ended up changing my life. I was at Lenox Hill. They put me in a telemetry unit to start for my graduate externship. Every day I walked down to the CCU and asked them, can I come there? Like every day from Monday through Friday, can I? And finally they was like, yo, you know what? Next week you could come, we're going to give you a week, right? And the program was for eight weeks. I spent the next seven weeks in the CCU. And they were like, we don't hire new grads. We don't hire new grads. Then I went down to NYU to interview because I just delayed my interview. So I went down to the interview and it was like, you got experience at Kings County Intensive Care, which is a level one trauma center. And then they're like, and you also have experience at Lenox Hill, which was like number two in the city at the time for heart. And they were like, we'll take you in critical care. And I was like, y'all can keep med surge. <laughs> but also sucked because the day after that interview at NYU, Linux Hill came back and offered me a job in CCU. Oh, another lesson. You don't got to be faithful to your employer. 
because I was like, oh, I got to, I can't, right? I got to be a man of my word. I got to go to NYU. It's like, man, but it was a blessing. Because had I stayed at Linux, I probably wouldn't have left bedside nursing so quick. But as soon as I got at NYU, I was like, oh, this is terrible. I'm, mm -mm, I had to leave. I had to leave. It was too much going on. No, I wanted to do critical care, off flight nursing. And once that happened, I was like, this is not for me. So I, you have a question in the back? No? He's just doing a wave. <laughs> <laughs> I've been an LPN for 13 years, and a couple of the RNs I work with are adamant that I have to do med surge. No. You don't feel that that's not important at all? Not at all. Not, a, not in the slightest. Plus, also, I think uh, med surge nurses get a bad rap. And I say they get a bad rap because they are overworked and, under re and have under-resources, right? Meaning... You go to a med surge unit, and it's usually like one person to like 10 patients, yes. right? At one time, right? As a nurse practitioner, when I was doing rounds, I was seeing 10 to 12 patients in a day. You have somebody that's responsible for 10 people for 12 and a half hours. A lot can go wrong, right? In fact, last summer, um, my aunt died on a med surge unit after coming from surgery, Right? And like my family was upset and pissed off and they were like, why aren't you doing anything to me? And my response was, I know the system. And because I know the system, I know exactly how this happened. She probably went in one moment, did the meds, did all it. My aunt was fine and went down the line. I like, you know how long it takes to do meds? You know how many meds these patients have? And by the time she got to like the sixth, seventh patient, mind you, there's probably only like two NAs, two nurses, uh, assistants, for the entire floor, and then now somebody says, yo, your patient's not breathing. You don't know how long she was down for. Yeah. Right? So they do get a bad rap. But no, you do not need to do med surge. You do it more from a standpoint of understanding the role as a nurse and learning yeah. the basics and all of that. You, you don't. And I have no intention of doing that. I have no intention <laughs> of doing that at all. And but. the reason why I say that is because, especially inpatient nursing, a lot of that is specialty. Right. Even med exactly. surge is a specialty in its own right, right? Critical care is a specialty. Um, mother baby is a specialty. Um, operating room specialty, right? Even operating room is a different specialty than post operating room. So it's all different specialties, and they want you to learn the way that you're supposed to learn according to that specialty. So no, you don't have. To. It's a very traditional way of thinking that you don't have to. Okay, folks, this was amazing. So we have to wrap it up. You know, but I want to thank Dr. Johnson. So I'll probably get um, Dr. Johnson's contact information in case any individuals want to be able to ask one or more questions. Right? And um, hopefully, because it's got such a busy schedule, hopefully he's able to we'll be able to reach out. For well, my students who are in the chemistry, um, who have an exam, I'll meet you in that classroom afterwards.